we begin uh, our meeting uh, talking about a very important issue on COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus, and learning what we can from the folks uh, at the head of the table. Uh, we're going to introduce ourselves to you. The chairs of the committee will introduce themselves, and the vice chairs of the committee will introduce themselves. Good afternoon, and you are the chair of House Human Services. Uh, Jenny Lyons, chair of uh, Senate Health and Welfare. Representative Bill Liver, chair of the House of Health and Welfare. Sandy Hutz, vice chair of House Human Services. Anne Donahue, vice chair of House Health Care. And the vice chair of uh, Senate. So thank you all for being here. Just a couple of housekeeping issues. One, uh, this is being live streamed on Vermont Public Radio, VPR. So the caution to us all is don't say anything you don't want your mother to hear. And, uh, and we'll, we'll uh, continue on through as much time as we need up until around 6 o'clock to talk about this very important issue and to hear from the administration on planning uh, and where we are and where we are going. So um, I think, I think um, Representative Lippert was going to talk about questions that might come from members. Given the numbers of us who are members of the committee, three committees, uh, we're going to recommend that if members of the committees or members in general have questions that you'd like to have asked, if you write it down, uh, and we're going to take a break at some point in time, and we'll ask those who have questions to kind of indicate, and we'll collect the questions and bring them to the table uh, and try to integrate them into our hearing. Terrific. So I would like to welcome our guests. Um, and ask you to please introduce yourselves. And I know you have uh, a program laid out for us. We've put some questions on our agenda, but we're certainly uh, we're open to hearing as much as you can provide for us. So we uh, were informed, and so we can inform our constituents. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just for the record, my name is uh, Mike Smith. I am the Secretary of Human Services. I'll, I'll allow people to introduce themselves as we do run a show here uh, going through, obviously, the, the, the main um, the, the main character to this uh, to this program will be Dr. Levine, but there's other things that we want to talk about. The EOC, the various uh, the Secretary of Education here, the Commissioner of Dale, uh, the Commissioner of DCF as well, and we'll talk about the various things that uh, that are happening because it's it, there's a wide variety. As you can imagine, the state has been very busy in our response to COVID-19, or as many people call it the coronavirus, the bulk of the activity has taken place at the health department um, with much activity. I was trying to get a list of some of the things that they were putting out, and we can get this to the committee, but it's a long list of information that they've uh, been helping to put out with other agencies and by themselves, and including health care providers, uh, the elderly, school officials. I won't go through the the list, but it's, it's extensive in terms of the communications that's been coming out of uh, that department. In addition, uh, you may have seen this on uh, the roadways. Uh, we have asked people to go to the health department website, and the reason for that is there is so much information about this virus, and it's updated daily in terms of what is going on in this virus, different things. Thank you. 
in coordination with one another and in accordance with the state emergency management plan. And so I'll ask uh, Commissioner Shirley in, in a moment to, to talk about that as well as Director Gordon to talk about that a little bit about what that will involve. Uh, as you, um, so I would like to sort of make sure that I don't sit here and, uh, and occupy a lot of time. What I want to do is get right to it and first turn to Dr. Levine and talk about what is, what is going on. Thank you all for uh, inviting us here today. Um, in terms of communication, I just seem to be on the phone that I have to do a TV spot at 6 o'clock uh, <laughs> to inform the public. Um, and so I may not be here all the way until 6. So I'm sure of any questions. Yeah, to me. <laughs> That's the word. Um, and I believe, in the context of the comments I prepared, the majority, but not all, of the questions that we've been tossing at at least uh, the answer is touched upon that could be expanded in 15 years. So, one of the areas that I know the legislature um, requested of me was to sort of a little bit of a coronavirus one-on-one, um, and I think that would be appropriate to start. As everybody knows, the illness is out on COVID-19, and that is caused by a virus called the coronavirus, one that we actually have no immunity to, because it actually jumped from an animal reservoir to the human population this year. Much like two previous uh, SARS epidemic and the MERS epidemic, some acute respiratory syndrome and the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome a number of years ago. Unlike that, it causes respiratory symptoms, and the core three symptoms are fever, cough, and for those who are on the more ill side of the spectrum, uh, shortness of breath. I will say from the outset that we are learning on a day-to-day -day basis more and more about this virus, but there is still a lot that is unknown because it hasn't been around that long for us. Probably been around for bats and many other types of animals for a lot longer. So a lot of our information is coming from very recently published material from out of China, uh, where our, as we know the original epicenter was. So I'll just sort of give you a little bit of case series types of information that kind of crystallizes what we know. Uh, the median age of the people in China who were ill was 59, uh, so it involves an older population. In fact, they had almost no one age 15 or less. The mean incubation period is about five days. We tell people four to seven days. But as you know, when we do isolate people or ask for them to voluntarily isolate, we go to a 14-day period because disease has been uh, presented in its latest 14 days. If one is severe enough to be hospitalized, it's usually not in the very earliest part of the illness, and the duration of the interval between the time one becomes ill and gets that ill to be hospitalized is in the 9 to 12 day range. As everybody knows, we have a positive case in Vermont, listed as presumptive positive because uh, every state case around the country that's positive needs confirmation by the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. I say that we have one case, and everyone knows that case is rather severely ill in the hospital. However, um, it's important to keep the context that 80 plus percent of people who get afflicted with COVID-19 will have what's termed a more mild to moderate illness. About 6% of the Chinese series require either a transfer to an intensive care unit, mechanical ventilation, uh, or possibly died. Um, in terms of how effective this virus is, 
there's a statistical number called the R naught, R zero. And for the flu, that's a little over one, which means that one person with the flu probably can infect another person. With coronavirus, it's 2.2. So for each person who's ill, an average of two other people might get infected from that in the next case. One needs to generally be within six feet of the person who is ill to have the respiratory droplets afflict them. That's in comparison to, to a disease like measles, where you could even be 100 feet away and still contract measles if you were not immunized. Case fatality rate in China is about 1.4 percent. We're thinking it's probably closer to one or slightly less than one percent as experiences in the game around the world. What does that mean? Well, I can give you several comparisons. The flu that we all know and love that we have here in the Northern Hemisphere this time of year is usually 0.1 percent case fatality rate. The other coronavirus epidemics I talked about have a much higher rate. So SARS at a 10% rate and MERS at a 30% rate. So that tells us right off the bat, this coronavirus, though it's new to us, it's scary, it's something that could potentially uh, culminate in death of a person, it's much less harmful than the other experiences that human beings have had in these coronaviruses that seem to jump from the animal it's very important to know who's at highest risk, and the highest risk population is labeled as over age 60, with or without chronic medical conditions, heart disease, lung disease, things of that sort, diabetes, uh, and with or without immunocompromised conditions. And though I did say the case fatality rate is closer to 1%, we need to keep in mind that that's an average across all ages. So if you look at the curve, when you get from childhood to the 50s, the fatality rate is essentially just a little bit above zero, and then it has an asymptotic steep increase as you get into the 70s and 80s, so that for somebody older, it could actually be in the 7 to 13%. That's why we're being so deliberate about uh, everything we say about the older population. Mentioned that the transmission is by these respiratory droplets, which is why we're also so attentive to the fact that anyone in healthcare needs to have full personal protective equipment, which is not just a mask, it would mean high protection as well. And again, we love of course. And it's why when I get to it, we'll talk a little bit about the concept of social distancing. In terms of numbers, the numbers are changing rapidly, but worldwide, we're talking in the 160,000 case range. Death-wise, we're talking 4,000 as of today. In the US, we're in the 800 case range, but if you want watching these numbers, in this last week is when they've been jumping uh, market from day to day. 22 deaths in the U.S., and the majority of those are related to California and Washington state cases, especially regarding the long-term care facility that was affected, which again hammers home the issue about the susceptible population. As I mentioned, we have one presumptive positive in Vermont, and we have no deaths. We are currently following, as a health department, 226 Vermonters. The number has gotten as high as in the 240s. Uh, following means varying levels of surveillance and supervision from the public health standpoint, knowing what kind of contact they may have had with others. We've actually completed the follow-up of 52 people, the majority of whom were uh, coming back from China in their 14 The issue of testing has come up and is a big concern to the population. Um, we 
are actually involved in a much more liberalized and non-restrictive testing protocol than we were required to follow by the CDC. The CDC uh, required hospitalization as a major criteria for being able to be tested. We have said we really need to do our health surveillance function in public health, so one does not need to be hospitalized to qualify. However, one should still have appropriate symptoms, appropriate travel history, or appropriate connection to a known positive case. The location of testing is an interesting topic because it's important that the healthcare system be protected. And, and so airborne infection isolation rooms, negative pressure rooms are sort of the state of the art. But we're learning a little from South Korea, where they've pioneered the use of drive-through testing. And indeed, Southwest Vermont Medical Center, where this first case has been involved, as we all know, uh, is now carrying that out successfully. I will keep the public in mind here that if one is just worried that they may have COVID-19 or has cold symptoms but nothing else, we don't expect that they will be driving through and getting a test. The test is still according to clinical judgment, which means that they're at least connected on the phone with their healthcare provider, and it requires a clinician's order. It's not um, like just going through any other kind of drive um, the volume of testing has escalated substantially. We probably did 40 tests total in the first week. Today, we have run 40 tests. Thus far, we have 40 negative tests prior to today, and one was on the positive that we discussed. Public health strategies used in an epidemic like this have some terms that are called containment and mitigation. Uh, without dwelling on them a lot, containment is just what it says. If you discover a positive case, you do everything in your power to isolate that case. You do contact tracing to make sure you know everyone who may have had contact with that case and hope that you can prevent future contact with anyone who's infected. So that has been the thrust of what we have done up until this point, both as a nation and as a state. As a nation now, though, uh, we're moving more to mitigation strategies. We in Vermont are still, I would say, on a parallel course where we're doing both containment and mitigation. So the containment involves contact tracing, risk assessment, providing public health recommendations, a lot of boots on the ground and ears on the telephone work for our epidemiologists and public health. Mitigation really is more of a preventative and preemptive strategy, if you will, uh, knowing that the disease has achieved a level of person-to-person -person transmission in the society and that containment, while still potentially useful, can't be one's entire strategy because the spread has already begun to occur. And that is uh, where the country is sort of thinking we are now. We're hoping in Vermont we can still do the parallel strategy for a bit longer. So what does mitigation involve? It involves what are called NPI, which is non-pharmaceutical interventions. That implies right off the top of that, there aren't group pharmaceutical interventions, and indeed we'll get to that. Um, so there's three levels of this type of strategy. One is the one that we all are familiar with, and that is individual strategies. All the advice we do, as we came in, we weren't shaking hands with each other, we were not uh, hopefully here because we're still symptomatic with a respiratory illness, we stayed home from work, we avoiding, we're avoiding others who are ill, we're practicing proper respiratory etiquette, coughing into sleeves and elbows and things, we're uh, washing our hands as many times a day as possible. 
last thing you guys talked about is a little bit more poetry and just things that I may have left out and answer some of the questions. We sent a lot of communications out, as I mentioned, on these health alert notifications to the clinical world, to um, also the separate ones of the clinical world on the explicit uh, information they need to know about testing and protocols. Um, we sent out these kinds of question screening and advice to hospitals, healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, et cetera. And we communicated, communicated a lot with the community as well. We had weekly phone calls with the executives and emergency preparedness parts of all the systems we just talked about. Um, there are federal funds that will be coming to Vermont uh, to help uh, pay for what has been an all-hands-on-deck effort uh, throughout state government and certainly at the health department level. And that, we believe, will be $4.9 million. A lot of that will be going to health surveillance, public health response efforts, laboratory testing. That's out of a pool of something in the range of $2 billion. There are other billions of dollars that are separately targeted towards things like pharmaceutical development, vaccine development, etc. But this is money I'm talking about for the states. And then finally, I again, I can't stop uh, my presentation without advertising healthforvon.gov uh, to get comprehensive information, to get the updates on a daily basis. And everyone should realize that uh, the nation is really following in lockstep with the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. So our website connects directly with the resources that are on their website. And if their website gets updated, ours is automatically updated. Uh, so that level of connection is really healthy. I will now allow Secretary Smith to move this on to the rest of our team. Thank you very much. I'd like to sort of move it now to the Emergency Operations Center and uh, introduce Commissioner Sherman to um, start the presentation from that side. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike Sherman, Commissioner of Public Safety. For the last several weeks, we've been updating uh, plans for both continuity of operations and emergency services uh, and a host of other topics uh, to support state government operations. Um, as you might imagine, those plans are largely in place for evolving events, but they can be updated as new information comes in. Uh, tomorrow will be the planned opening of the Emergency Operations Center uh, with a partial activation. Uh, I'm sure everyone will look into more detail about the way and how things will flow. The uh, general overview is that we are planning to uh, formalize and enhance uh, coordination among resources, both on a state level and on a municipal and county level. Um, some of that has already been uh, in motion, but we'll more formalize that using the structures that are in place with the Emergency Operations Center. We'll provide additional support to the Department of Health, who's been on the front lines of this for several weeks, um, including such things as tracing assistance, uh, communication support, and whatever else they may need. Uh, we will additionally uh, begin to ramp up uh, additional communication statewide with key constituencies. Again, much of that's been done for several weeks now to the Department of Health. We will bring some additional resources to the table to be able to assist with that. Those include first responders, emergency managers, uh, legislators, municipal leaders, uh, key types of organizations ranging from uh, schools to others. Again, uh, the agency of education has been doing much of that now. We'll provide additional support to that role. Um, we will also continue planning for uh, phased responses to the situation as it evolves uh, from an emergency services perspective and including uh, ensuring that we have the best uh, plans for continuity of operations for first responders and emergency communications, which are uh, among the most important things to keep uh, flowing uninterrupted. So that's the overview of the role uh, that we will take on as the emergency operations center opens and director Warren we can uh, bring you into a little more detail about what actually happens. Sure, thank you. My name is Eric Warren and I'm the director of Vermont Emergency Management. Um, so I'll just begin by saying that the state of Vermont has a state emergency management plan that provides the overall framework for response and recovery to all hazards, including infectious diseases. So the State Emergency Operations Center is the physical location where that coordination happens. And again, we, we activate uh, in preparation for and response to and recover from uh, 
if I was to make a comparison, a very light comparison, um, to another hazard that we would activate the State Emergency Operations Center for in preparation, uh, it would be a hurricane coming from New England where we might have to activate the CDOC uh, in preparation for without having real good knowledge about what level of impact will actually be experienced within the state, but we need to, uh, to ramp up the resources and have the information pathways uh, open so that we're prepared to do so. The CDOC is a scalable uh, system, so as we mentioned, uh, we'll be activating
to not only be prepared but also um, support those responders on the ground in healthcare systems. <coughs> Let me just, uh, I failed to mention in the beginning, and this is a partnership, a nominal partnership with the legislature, but the partnership with the federal delegation. We've been in close contact with the federal, the federal delegation. They have been wonderful through this uh, process. Some of this stuff we're going to work out. I mean, we know that it's going to be in the, the three buckets that the commissioner had talked about in terms of the 4.9 million, but we are still trying to explore and the congressional de delegation has asked us what other needs will we will we need in order to uh, fulfill this response. We also in the next two days expect to be talking to you all about uh, the various responses that uh, we may need from uh, the city legislature as well. I'd like to, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of days dealing with schools. There was a guidance that went out today uh, to school superintendents, and I'd like our Secretary French to address the guidance that went out today. I'm happy to do so. Hi, I'm Dan French, Secretary of Education. Uh, as Commissioner, our Secretary Smith said, we've been uh, working very closely with our school partners uh, to implement the guidelines developed by both the Department of Health and the CDC. Uh, as uh, Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, the public health strategies basically fall into two groups containment and mitigation. Uh, the issue of school closure falls into that latter category of mitigation strategies. And that's emerged, uh, as, as noted in the media, uh, hopefully more frequently in the last uh, 40 hours. The the issue of school closure falls into that second category of strategies known as mitigation strategies. The uh, uh, our guidance, as, as mentioned, was published today. It really is a reiteration of the guidance that has been published by the CDC on school closure. I would say as a reaction to H one N one and some of our experience with similar types of issues. Um, the, the school closure, based on that guidance, falls into three categories. We have what we call selective school closures, reactive school closures, and preemptive school closures. Uh, selective school closures really pertain in a very small area of when students, schools have a very specific vulnerable student population. Students might be medically fragile, um, and special consideration of their needs is, is justifies the closure of that, that facility. Reactive school closures occur when a large number of students and faculty become ill and continuing to operate the school becomes difficult. Um, in my experience, we saw that, that during the H1N1 um, situation that we had schools closed because the students were coming to school sick and being sent home or large numbers of faculty were ill. Uh, the last category of school closure is a preemptive school closure, and that's the one that's needing more media attention. And this is when we close school in advance of uh, illness as a, as a strategy to prevent its further uh, spread. Uh, we're not at that point in Vermont uh, where preemptive school closures we think are necessary, but we are making plans to do that. And that was part of the uh, strategy today to issue that guidance. Uh, we have had uh, several schools over the weekend uh, on Monday, I would, I would say falling into the category of reactive school closures. Um, as mentioned, we're still pursuing those containment strategies school closure as a mitigation strategy. So we had schools uh, having to address very specific concerns around either faculty or student travel, potential illness, and so forth. And the phrase uh, for consistent from superintendents is the abundance of caution uh, metric. So they've been uh, being proactive in closing schools um, out of abundance of caution, conducting basically disinfection activities. Uh, we, we started with a group of schools in the Wyndham Southwest supervising Yeah. 
and the Wilson School was closed. Uh, very similar uh, the concepts that they were addressing. Uh, you know, an abundance of caution uh, information they had as they waited for better confirmation of results and so forth. I believe we also had the uh, Lake River School close uh, in a similar situation. We've also had a number of situations where superintendents decided not to close schools based on the information they had. They were uh, working closely with the Department of Health, working closely with uh, our agency to determine the specifics of their meeting situations. But at this point, we're not planning a larger strategy of preemptive school closure, though that very well could be coming at some point in the future, so we're, we're developing those plans now. Um, I would also say in our guidance, we're addressing issues related to school closure. The school closure can also be very disruptive to communities. Uh, the issue of how we feed children, for instance, uh, we've been in contact with the U.S. Department of Education uh, to obtain a waiver on uh, the need to, uh, there's a requirement from the USDA to offer meals in a congregate setting, so we need a waiver to feed students not altogether in cafeteria when we're trying to enact a strategy of social, uh, you know, to create a greater distance between students. So we, yes, yesterday we requested that with a waiver from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Many member states, I would say, are also pursuing these strategies, so we're not uh, unique in that regard. We're working in concert with our uh, partners across the country. Uh, we're also uh, in the guidance addressing the needs of special needs students who, whose programs have to be addressed uh, to a certain extent as a result of school closure. Um, and we're also pursuing uh, issues of funding and so forth relative to our federal grants. You know, we rely on a lot of federal money to operate our school districts and issues of professional development, issues of conference participation, and so forth. Uh, so we're working in concert with other states to get a better understanding of how the federal government will address those issues in case we, uh, we have one more widespread school board. Can I ask one question? Sure. Um, the decision to close the school will remain with the superintendents going forward, or will there be any um, communication about that? Yeah, essentially the superintendent retains that, that responsibility. As I mentioned, there's three essential, consider them levels of school closure, the preemptive being the most significant. Basically, depending on the significance of that closure, there's a requirement to have a greater consultation with the Department of Health and the Agency of Education. In particular, you can get the public health information to help inform that decision. Uh, my involvement uh, certainly is to provide as a resource to help them uh, implement the guidance, but also um, I have some direct responsibility relative to waiving calendar days and student attendance requirements and so forth. So that's, that's why it's important both to consult both of us in that process. But the decision-making will re re reside at the superintendent level, uh, but more direct involvement with the agency of education and the Department of Health uh, as we get into the more significant types of school closures. Thank you. One of the things you've heard a uh, theme here throughout this presentation is the concentration in terms of the strategy on those that are elderly, frail, uh, those that may be underlying medical uh, conditions. And therefore, I wanted to make sure that I brought um, the Commissioner Dale here to talk about some of the strategies that we, we have employed, as well as some of the vulnerable population that I wanted to talk about with uh, DCF. Um, we didn't bring, um, because we wanted to, but we didn't bring DOC and mental health as well, which is, uh, you know, there's similar strategies there Uh, good afternoon, Monica Hutt. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. Um, so you've heard Dr. Levine already speak to this, but the populations that are most at risk when we think about COVID-19 are those older Vermonters and Vermonters with underlying health conditions. When I think about the population at Dale, certainly I feel like we support um, and offer services to those populations across the board, especially considering as well those individuals with disabilities who do tend to have medical conditions and, and complicated profiles. Um, so in terms of that, we have worked really hard to amplify and leverage the work that's already happening at the North Vermont Department of Health. Um, they have a tremendous system in place, they've got tremendous communications, and our goal has really been to articulate um, what they are already doing and to push that out to our providers across the board. 
Vermont is unique in that we certainly do have long-term care facilities, and I'll give you a quick list of all of those. But I, it's important for us to remember that most of our older Vermonters, most of our Vermonters with disabilities are served in community as well. And so we have to consider the whole as we're considering the kinds of strategies and communications that we can kind of push out the door. Um, and BDH has been tremendous in working with us to really tailor communications as much as we can. Um, I do have some things that I'll need for the committee to look at, just a couple of examples of some of the policies and communications that we're pushing out specific to long-term care. So when I think about our long-term care facilities, we certainly think about nursing homes, but we already also have residential care homes, we have therapeutic care residences, assisted living facilities, we have one ICF um, in developmental services down in the Rutland area. There are group homes, and those group homes serve not only Dale, but the Department of Mental Health, they have substance abuse, and also DCF. We also have micro-residentials, so there are lots of different facilities or buildings that are caring for individuals where these individuals live. Um, and that's what we're targeting when we're talking about long-term care. We're not exclusively thinking only about our nursing home population, but all of those different entities. Um, and when we're pushing out communications, we're pushing it out to all of those entities. We also have other service methodologies across the state of Vermont. There is an enormous population of individuals in shared living, an individual living with a family or a care provider. We've got foster care as well. So again, trying to consider the needs of all of those populations and identify what kind of information is precautionary and preventative and how do we get that information to them in a way that's easy to understand and is quick. Um, we also have a lot of one-to-one -one supports happening across the state of Vermont. Again, not only in jail, but in mental health, um, in, in uh, Penn Shop and DCF, and in substance abuse. And so again, considering all of those populations and what we need to tell them to continue doing the work that they're doing safely and in caring for individuals as safely as they can. I feel like I'm just giving you lists, but I also don't want to forget that we have senior centers, meal sites, adult day programs, area agencies on aging, um, all of our designated agencies and specialized service agencies that are caring for Vermonters every single day of the week. So again, trying to get information to them that is useful, that is um, valuable, and that talks about really practical um, strategies is what's been most important for us. And the VDH has been, a, I can't say enough about the kind of partner that they've been in designing things for us. I keep feeling like I'm raising my hand and saying, hey, what about me? Make it special for me. Um, and they've been tremendous about doing that. So I'm very grateful, um, as are, are all the monitors. So I want to just tell you a couple of things um, that we're doing right now, um, and then leave it over to Ken and, and leave it open to some questions. So I've talked already about the ongoing coordination with BDH. We have a place on the Dale website in case any of our providers go there first that links directly to the BDH website, which as um, Commissioner Levine spoke to already, is updated regularly with CDC information. Um, the two policies that I have to leave for you
um, in order to push those out on some sort of a frequently asked questions part of our website page. Um, just today, hot off the press, and I don't have uh, it for you, but we developed uh, with BDH guidelines for um, independent support workers. Anybody who's working one-on-one -on -one with an individual um, could include a foster parent, certainly could include any of the individuals that are working with our developmental services population, certainly um, all of our heirs workers, the independent support workers. That guidance was approved just today. It will go out as a mailing in the heirs payroll In addition, we do make it clear, because we are talking about a lot of different 
stakeholders and constituencies, that our staff are available to help support them on a one-to-one -one basis. So I, I do want you to know that, that we are mindful that every situation can be a little bit different. Every person who has a concern, we need to be respectful of that and do our best. And oftentimes, obviously, we rely upon the Department of Health. But to the extent we can help support our foster parents, who obviously serve an incredibly important role for our children and our community, that we want to support them uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So, so we're continuing this effort, and uh, let me sort of close there. Thank you very much. And uh, Madam Chair, we'll uh, take any questions. I do want to just reiterate, uh, between uh, Erica and Mark, she's their former, between the commissioner and the director, uh, this has been an incredible team effort uh, that has really transpired here in the last uh, few weeks. And I, I, I
week. Um, I don't know. Commissioner? I would say we would be using uh, generic UL CDC guidance. The CDC has not traveled to Vermont because of the case. It provides specific uh, input. So it would only be the input we provided as the public comment. Um, Commissioner, uh, as a sort of follow up around these questions that people are having um, around nursing homes and all of the residential facilities but under your own. Yeah. How many staff do you actually have in terms of surveying certification who actually can be responding and providing guidance? And then if you can give us a number of how many facilities they are actually um, responsible for doing. Uh, yes, so we, there are uh, 34 nursing homes in this state of Vermont, actually 36, 34 in Medicaid, and two do not take Medicaid. About 138, approximately 138 or 140 residential care homes. Um, so those are the licensed facilities, and that includes assisted living in those two numbers. We have, uh, uh, gosh, I just did my budget testing, do you think I would know this? Um, <laughs> as you were speaking about all of the places that um, a vulnerable adult may be, yes. an, uh, an older Vermonter may be residing from, from a shared living, from a home with personal care attendants coming in through a uh, nursing home. Um, and all of the incredible work that your staff is trying to do to provide guidance uh, I've heard concerns, some of which I share, that do, is there sufficient staff to, in fact, carry out these activities? Well, certainly this is a very unusual time, um, and so everybody is, is um, stretched at this moment in time, I think. Um, in terms of our, the number of surveyors that we have under surveyors, which is where most of the licensing happens, I believe that we have uh, uh, between 11 and 15 nurse surveyors um, for the facilities that I mentioned earlier. I have a question here for the commissioner of health, and that is, do the current flu shots help at all with the virus? <laughs> Not to my uh, knowledge. However, the flu <laughs> is widespread in Vermont still, and currently today, if you could not let the symptoms I have mentioned, you're more likely to have the flu than COVID-19. Okay, thank you.
within that jurisdiction uh, in partnership with the select board. Um, and so there's a number of resources that are available to them, uh, and we will be starting to uh, communicate with them on a, on a voice basis, on a uh, basis on a regular basis, as well as with elected officials um, on, a, uh, on a recurring weekly basis. Um, and there's, there's a number of different resources out there um, that are uh, that exist across state government. So um, I just don't want to spend a lot of time talking about all what all of those are. But I would um, I would recommend that uh, that all of the emergency management directors uh, communicate with us if they have a necessary resource need, and we'll be we'll be reaching out with them. They're all volunteers. There, there are some that may have a, a stipend, but there's no um, there's no formal system for for payment of those entities. I mean, our whole state is dependent on volunteers. Anyway, um, secretary. Madam Chair, I.
we we just don't know yet uh, what is what is going to happen. We're going to have to scale depending on what what is happening. Um, but right now, with what we've done so far, it is uh, it's commendable what everybody is doing, including the, by the way, including the legislature today, legislative leadership, and their commitment to work cooperatively with everyone. If I may, this is a quick. I know you need to go. Uh, I want to first acknowledge that uh, from the health care committee's point of view, just generally uh, to removing any financial barriers to testing, uh, which has been uh, communicated through the Department of Health. But I'm not sure everyone knows that information, and I think it's important for anyone listening to know that there will be no cost sharing uh, to Vermonters who are on commercial insurance. There will be no cost sharing if you're on Medicaid or Medicare, uh, and that if you're uninsured, there will be no cost to you. The state has made this decision, and through an emergency bulletin through the Department of Financial Regulation, the path in our committee, and I think all Vermonters should be aware that the cost should not be a barrier to seeking uh, testing uh, for treatment with regard to COVID-19, uh, if, you, if you believe that's an issue. Uh, separately, I wanted to ask, uh, I was kind of overhearing someone actually came to the state house today saying, oh yes, I just came back from Seattle. And I was like, oh, Seattle. <laughs> I'm wondering 
list of those. But if the school is closed and employees or teachers are not able to work, and um, how are we? Are we looking at compensation? Are we looking at extended budgets? What any thoughts there? That last for the next part. Yeah, I think it's a little early. Uh, we're early. having those conversations. We do draw the distinction the CDC does between a school closure and a school dismissal. Yeah. And I should mention that one of our, one of the schools in the state did that exact thing. And actually, the second day of the closure in um, in Wyndham Southwest, they did a dismissal. A dismissal is when students are not in session, but the staff are working. Uh, so the CDC recommends that as a, as a possible strategy because it allows staff to be available to provide services. We have the ability in many locations to provide online learning, um, but to have staff available in food service and so forth to uh, support families and children when they're out in school. So but we don't, the specific things we'll have to address as this unfolds. It might not come up, um, but individuals, uh, the, school, the school officials are already asking these questions. So a related question is, suppose the school is closed, but people still need to work, and they don't have child care, and how are we communicating with businesses about that kind of situation? And that is a very good question, and one that we're really looking at taking a close look at right now. We've had that. We've reached out. There's a couple of ways that we, we've talked about this. How do we provide assistance to those people that say to their employer, I don't have any sick leave, or the employer says, you know, I can't afford for you to be home, uh, so I can't pay you. We're looking at that uh, right now. We reached out to our federal partners because we may need some uh, federal changes in some, whether it's uh, unemployment insurance laws or some other things that are going on. But I will say, stay tuned. In the next few days, we'll be back to you with uh, something Uh, I have two more questions. One is uh, pretty direct to the 211 and the calls that are coming in at 211. Do we have sufficient resources and people to respond to those calls? Yes, we do. And I'll let Eric, Eric if you want me to do it, because there was a, uh, the, the volume to let me attempt it and kick me under the table if I'm wrong, but the volume of calls that we have been coming that have come to are remarkably lower than what we expected. Um, uh, on the other hand, the hit to the website has been quite robust, as we, uh, which is um, with what we want, to be honest with you. Uh, we want people to visit that website to get the, the latest information possible. But I don't, the, unless uh, you wake me off, the recent numbers that I saw, the 31 numbers that I saw, increases, but it hasn't been overwhelming to the system. Yeah, and, um, we have, we work closely with 211 as well because there are a general disaster referral service um, for, for all hazards, and um, they are doing some planning for uh, anticipating additional call volume and working with the folks at Servermont and their work to look for additional volunteers to staff up. Last question that I have in front of me um, is what legally can be done if an individual um, has, been, has decided that he or she is not going to self-quarantine, even if told to do so? Can you stop them from traveling around the community or to events? I think that's been on the minds of a lot of people since uh, a recent event. There has been an incident that we took um, that I remember Again, taking under the table. The answer is that I think we have some rules and laws that allow us to uh, mandate quarantine if, if possible. I think it came up during, during the Ebola incident uh, where a, 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 a gentleman said he had traveled to Africa and had not was not self-quarantined. 
short of some of these in corn. It, it is on the books. It's very old, but that doesn't mean it isn't still valid. It probably is an update. Yes, 